All right, well, welcome everyone to our weekly Wednesday webinar series. Um, real quick, if you're having any audio issues, head up to that um, sound check audio tab and then click sound check. If that doesn't work, try switching between phone or computer. If that doesn't work, please log out, log back in, and that should resolve 99% of any of your sound issues. Um, for those of you who want Con Ed, um, the survey will pop up at the end. Otherwise, uh, it'll be sent to you an hour later. So it's the same survey. Please just take it once. Um, and even if you don't need CUs, we certainly appreciate all of your feedback to help make our sessions better. So um, please take that see that uh, that um, the quiz, uh, not quiz, uh, survey. Uh, and then also uh, tomorrow, we're uh, really cool. We've got our member, uh, Doug Salby of Metal Arc Builders. Um, he's building a really cool project focusing on a renovation, new construction, uh, addition kind of project for uh, the world's first living building and passive house certified multifamily rental unit in Ann Arbor. And this is actually a, a citizens participation meeting. Uh, so it's required to do this for the city. And because it's not safe to meet in person, we're like, let's do it live um, online. And, and so we're gonna be doing that tomorrow. And even if you don't live in Ann Arbor, uh, we wanna hear have you join us and learn. And then on the 11th, Monday, we're doing a three-day Lead for Homes training, um, green, big green Raider training. So if you want to get that credential, check that out. Um, if you support our mission, want to empower people to make uh, the places we live better, get instant access to all these webinars plus discounts like on that Green Raider training and many other benefits, um, go to our website and become a member today. All right, well, welcome everyone to Pollinator and Wildlife Friendly Solar, the good, the bad, and the bees. This course is approved for GBCI, AIBD, BPI, non whole house, as well as AIA Health, Welfare, and Safety, which may make it applicable to your state-based design or contractor license. Um, today, I will be your moderator. My name is Brett Little, and I am the executive director here at the nonprofit, the Green Home Institute. Um, real quick, uh, you know, how do we make solar PV and solar PV farms more sustainable? Um, you know, they can be done better. Uh, there's always more we can do. And that's kind of what the focus is going to be here from an eco um, ecology standpoint. And a huge thanks to our top tier sponsor, Mitsubishi Electric. Uh, they provide all your heating, cooling, and ventilation needs all in one. Today's low load homes require right sized equipment that most systems, especially gas fired, cannot meet. Mitsubishi has low load, high efficient heat pumps that dehumidify and cool in the summer and then uh, work in reverse to heat in the winter. Going ductless reduces costs and makes it easier to meet Energy Star 3 and lead for homes. Uh, ductless mini splits can now be hidden in many different ways to meet your client's needs and ducted systems can now be used as well. Uh, ducted systems are hidden behind the walls to help ensure beautiful space and can be retrofitted in uh, to replace a furnace or existing uh, single family or multi-family project. Also, they have our brand new hyperheat uh, model that's come out that works down to the lowest of low temperatures um, uh, and continues to work as it gets really cold during very rare times of the year. Also, each room of a house can customize comfort while still being all electric and energy efficient for clients with different needs uh, to only heat and cool rooms. This also can apply to multi-family and commercial buildings with uh, variable refrigerants uh, and heat recovery technology to simultaneously heat and cool. Check them out at MitsubishiComfort.com. And then also a uh, big thanks to our uh, secondary sponsor, Niagara Conservation. Uh, Niagara provides um, low flow uh, toilets, shower heads, and aerators down to uh, 0.8 gallons. Uh, we have uh, Tim Montague, I'm very excited to have Tim on for a session, um, be talking to you uh, about solar and wildlife friendly farms. He is a um, solar PV expert and works in commercial industrial government, nonprofit campus clients all across Illinois to help them achieve their energy conservation and sustainability goals through solar and battery storage solutions. Tim is the founder of Pollinator and Wildlife Friends Solar Farm Working Group in Illinois, a project of CES, and he's the host and creator of Solar Works for Illinois, the monthly podcast about solar industries. He is active in the Solar Energy Industries Association. He holds a master in botany from the University of Wisconsin, Madison, and lives in um, Champaign-Urbana, Illinois with his two cats, two children, 
and he is an avid trail runner and outdoor enthusiast. So with that, Tim, I am going to hand it off to you. Please take it away and hopefully you have better luck than me. <laughs> Oh, you're self-muted there, Tim. Sorry. Thank you, Brett. And thank you to the Green Home Institute. I'm uh, proud to be in your midst. As we all know, solar energy is growing by leaps and bounds. And I like to say that I have a dream come true situation on my hands as a solar enthusiast my father and I were doing backyard solar thermal in New Mexico and Albuquerque where I grew up in the 70s and PV wasn't on the scene because it was $100 a watt. It was in space on satellites, of course, and remote telecommunications applications, but not on homes and buildings for the most part. Now the, thing, uh, now the landscape is very different and we are seeing large scale power purchase agreements in the two to three cent range uh, in the United States. So solar PV is going head to head with all other sources of energy. And that is one of the primary drivers of why we see so much solar happening in the United States. I want to uh, point out that I stand on many shoulders here and I will uh, thank specific individuals. Uh, you see here the rusty patch bumblebee which is a federally endangered bumblebee here in illinois and it is still found in in the chicago area but uh, its numbers have dwindled by 90 percent in the last uh, decade so it is a bellwether for many other pollinators that are struggling in our increasingly built-on environment so today we're going to learn about uh, understanding the difference between pollinator friendly and industrial monocrop what is agrivoltaics? That's just another word for pollinator friendly, but I can talk a little more generally about agrivoltaics as well. And what are the best practices for planting and maintaining pollinator friendly uh, solar farms? And then we'll get an overview of some of the projects and case studies and talk about some of the challenges and opportunities for the renewable energy industry, as well as the differences in large versus small scale. So here's an outline of my talk. We're gonna go into drivers of PV. I've touched on that a little bit. Why eco-friendly solar? That's another way to describe pollinator-friendly solar. Uh, I find eco-friendly is a little easier to say uh, and perhaps easier to understand in some circles, but they're interchangeable. Land use considerations. We are largely naive of how we use our land in the United States on a large scale. So I have some slides showing how we do use our land and the relatively small amount of land we need to go 100% solar. What are some of the best practices? Of course, case studies and resources. So why solar, why now? The long and short of that is the cost of solar has come down 90% in the last decade. Okay, so that is a very strong driver. Solar is still relatively expensive for small scale applications like residential, um, but we do see it with uh, in places where you have incentives or where it goes mainstream like in California, they have few incentives, but power is expensive and it is ubiquitous Everybody wants solar. It, it offers an attractive uh, re reduction in your carbon footprint, potentially resiliency against grid outages if you combine it with batteries. And <clears throat> there are several other drivers though. Um, economics being a primary one. The utilities are getting into renewable energy big time. This is an Excel energy project in Minnesota known as North Star Solar. It is about 1,000 acres, 100 megawatts AC, powers 20,000 homes. You can see that this is a farming landscape or an agricultural landscape. 
and the conversion of ag lands to solar is a real phenomenon in the Midwest, starting in Minnesota and now coming on strong in Illinois, Wisconsin, Michigan, Ohio, and even Indiana. Excel Energy has put a stake in the ground that they are going to be a 100% clean powered by 2050. And you see these uh, large utilities. Excel is a very large utility. It serves a gigantic swath of uh, the West and the Midwest. And they are not doing this necessarily for the environmental benefits first and foremost. Even though that is a real benefit, they are doing this for economic reasons. Dirty coal plants, legacy carbon infrastructure is expensive to run. It's expensive to build. And so what these utility operators are learning is that it's cheaper to convert their fleets to wind and solar. And that is what is going on on mass. Legislation is very important. Uh, there are uh, renewable portfolio standards are kind of a foundation for renewable energy in various locales. Over 30 states now have RPSs. Uh, I have a, a list here of some of the states that have very large RPSs and some that have less large. California, New York, Virginia, New Mexico, Washington, Nevada, all of those places have 100% RPSs now. Even though we're excited about our 25% RPS here in Illinois, we are tasked with achieving 25% clean power by 2025. And we have great solar renewable energy credit incentives. That's a cash incentive to system owners and developers. The way that SRECs work is they, in Illinois, they pay for about 40% of a project's value in the first five years of the project. And so without SRECs or before we had a, a lucrative SREC market, we had maybe a 12 to 15 year payback period. Now we have a four to six year payback period. And that makes solar attractive at all scales from residential on up to utility scale. RPSs are good, but not completely necessary. Uh, you'll notice that Florida and Georgia, for example, here do not have RPSs, but they do have solar markets. And uh, I think I have a slide here. Well, I'll get, I, I have a slide coming up where I will, uh, you will see how uh, Florida is a big utility scale market, not so much for what we call DG or distributed generation or rooftop solar. So this is another example of how solar is playing out in the Midwest. This is a 1600 acre, 200 megawatt solar farm that is planned uh, 10 miles southeast of my home here in Urbana-Champaign in the town of Sydney. Uh, this project was designed or located near a ginormous substation. That's that red square there in the upper left of the site plan. And I've had the pleasure of getting to know the developer, uh, a company called Bewa Re. That is a German company. They have deep agricultural roots. They make ag equipment. They see renewable energy as ag equipment. They want to install and sell solar farms and then maintain them. Uh, just like they might sell a tractor and then offer the tractor owner a maintenance agreement. They don't want to own the tractor but they want to maintain it. They want to build it and maintain it. And solar is a win-win for farmers. While it is taking land out of cash crop, here in central Illinois, we have, of course, corn and beans, and that is uh, true of much of the upper Midwest. Farmers can triple their income on a per acre basis by converting their land to solar energy. And while only a tiny fraction of the landscape is going to get converted to solar energy, and I will talk a little bit about this, we need about half a percent of the contiguous US 
to generate all of our power from solar. Of course, that needs to be combined with storage. Uh, lithium ion is now going mainstream and you see power plants, coal burning, gas burning, being replaced by wind, solar, and lithium ion storage facilities. Here's that cost and growth curve that is indicative of the rise of solar in the United States. We're now at $1.50 a watt. We were, uh, you know, 10 years ago at $6 a watt. And that's the, uh, the average installed price of, of solar. So, you know, for residential solar, it's like buying a car. You're talking 15 to $30,000 for uh, the average residential solar system now in the United States. And the payback period varies from, from five to 10 years, depending on what incentives there are and what the price of power is. Here in the Midwest, solar has been relatively slow to come, mainly because power is so cheap. We might pay nine cents a kWh for residential electricity on the coasts. They might pay three times that. And so if you go to New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, or California, Colorado, Arizona, New Mexico, solar is everywhere. They are 10 years ahead of us. Uh, and, but now we're, we're coming on strong and we're, and we're playing catch up. Uh, this is just another statistic showing how much solar is getting developed. 30 gigawatts were announced in 2019. The United States is now installing around 15 gigawatts per year, and we're approaching a total install base of 100 gigawatts. We need about 2,000 gigawatts total to be 100% solar powered. Another example of ag land converted to solar. This is a five megawatt project at the University of Illinois here in the community I live in. This is not a pollinator friendly project. Um, you can see, if you look down the row here, it's just turf grass. The developer of this project was a, a, a very small company from uh, Southern California and they didn't realize how good our soil is. So the weeds started growing up through the array and people started complaining just by being able to drive down the the road and the array isn't very visible from from a major road you're looking at the back side of the array from a major road but people could see these weeds in in the midwest our weeds can be 10 feet tall and so if you don't know what you're doing with the landscaping and doing proper maintenance you can get uh, problems from a pr perspective so pollinator friendly of course does assist with that and um, it, you have to be proactive and educate the public though that pollinator friendly is different than a weed farm. We're seeing now uh, the large, a large percentage of the utility scale, these are one megawatt and up projects using technology called single axis tracker. So I just wanted to show a photo of a tracker. I took this in Colorado. This is in the winter, so it's very brown. Um, and a lot of the solar out west, of course, the western United States is, is much more dry or xeric. And it's not really a hotbed of pollinator friendly work as far as I can tell. The Midwest is really the epicenter uh, and that has now spread to the Northeast. So it grew out of Minnesota and now all the neighboring states and, uh, you know, including Michigan, Wisconsin, Illinois, uh, and then up into the Northeast, Vermont, New York, Massachusetts. So here's that uh, slide showing the growth of residential, non-residential, which is commercial and utility scale solar. Really 2010 was the turning point and uh, it's been growing strong and growing exponentially. I got into the solar industry full-time in 2016 and that was a homecoming because I'm an ecologist, I'm lifelong interested in sustainability. I had been working more in the green building realm and now I work full time in solar, doing commercial industrial and working with solar developers that are doing in Illinois largely community solar, which is uh, 10 to 20 acre solar farms. 
And then we have some larger projects like the Baywa project I mentioned, which is called Prairie Solar. Here's a map by SEIA, the Solar Energy Industry Association. And this is an interactive map. Uh, I just have a snapshot of it here, but you can see that solar is happening a lot in even the Southeast, like Florida here, where they don't have an RPS. And that's because the utility is investing in utility scale solar. Uh, they obviously have very good solar resources, lots of sunlight, and uh, but the, at the same time, the utility has fought distributed generation or what we call rooftop solar. So it's, it's not as conducive for residents to install solar on their homes, but there is a lot of utility scale solar happening. And then you see here in the upper Midwest, Minnesota is a real hot spot and now Illinois. And this, uh, there's actually many more projects uh, on this uh, happening in Illinois than are on this map. So this map is slightly out of date, but there's 111 community solar projects getting built in the next 12 months here in Illinois. These are, like I said, five to, uh, sorry, 10 to 20 acre projects. These are two megawatt AC or 2.4 to 2.8 megawatt DC solar farms. And then you see into Indiana and Ohio and Michigan. Uh, Ohio has quite a bit of utility scale. Michigan has utility scale. Wisconsin has some very large, you know, upwards of 350 megawatt uh, utility scale solar projects happening. Some of them pollinator friendly, some not. So lots of opportunity. We are going to install about two to three million acres of solar farms in the next 10 years in the United States. And that's really the opportunity. So you're taking land that is either prime farm ground, like some of it here in Illinois, that's getting converted to community solar or utility scale solar farms, or subprime could be uh, conservation land and um, could be brownfields. We call it brownfields to bright fields. I'm involved in several of those projects, taking closed landfills and converting them to solar fields. That's a great way to repurpose a landfill. So we're adding about 13 to 15 gigawatts per year. Uh, there's a thousand megawatts in a gigawatt and there's five to seven acres per megawatt. So the way that plays out is uh, we need about 10 to 15 million acres for 100% solar. That's a tiny fraction. 10 million acres is half a percent of the United States, the uh, contiguous lower 48. So we have many other land uses, which I'm gonna show here that are using much, much, much more of our land. And then the drivers, uh, just to reiterate, the cost of solar has come down 90% in the last 10 years. So that's a major driver, affordability. Renewable portfolio standards, very good drivers not essential as we've seen for utility scale, generally quite essential if you wanna have distributed generation. So get involved with your statewide solar industry association. Most states have them now. In Illinois, it's the Illinois Solar Energy Association, ICEA. And then uh, SEIA has statewide chapters. Some of them are one and the same, like our, our ICEA is also a SEIA chapter. So get involved. And then there are very generous tax and cash incentives. Right now, the tax incentive is called the ITC, the investment tax credit. That is 26% of the value of the project. So if you build a solar project on your home, on your business, utility scale, you can write off 26% of the value of, of most of the equipment involved in that project. Certainly the major equipment, the modules, racking and inverters, and uh, that's it. So that's a very generous incentive. That incentive is stepping down. It was 30%. Now it's 26% in 2020. In 2021, it goes to 22%. And then it's going down to 10% uh, indefinitely, unless we have action in Washington. Certainly the current administration is not going to probably extend the ITC, but if we have a, have a Democrat in the office, that could change. Why eco-friendly solar? Well, of course, for most of this audience, it's a no-brainer. If you're gonna convert land to a solar farm, you may as well make it environmentally friendly 
as possible or as, as environmentally friendly as possible. It's good for people. It's good for profit. It's good for planet. And, um, and it's good for pollinators. Um, this is a map that Argonne National Laboratory put together. Argonne does a lot of energy research. I know them historically as a nuclear research place, but they've gotten interested in renewable energy also. And they're teamed up with NREL on uh, a program called Inspire. So they're running around doing research on uh, solar farms and pollinators throughout the upper Midwest, mostly in Minnesota, just by the nature of uh, that market, having so many solar farms now. Uh, Illinois is coming though, so they will be expanding. But what this shows is that there is uh, pollinator reliant crops within one and a half kilometers of solar facilities. So already, while solar is still uh, in in the early stages, right? We're we're chomping at the bit for five percent solar in the United States, right? If we hit the hundred gigawatt mark, that's uh, going to be the five percent mark, pretty much. And but in many places, uh, include and, and and darker is a hotter spot. So you see California, where there's a lot of solar, and there's a lot of pollinator dependent crops like almonds, for example, and then the Carolinas. Uh, and Minnesota. So to sum that up, you know, insects are relatively small and sometimes invisible to us, right? But they're responsible for pollinating nearly 75% of all crops worldwide uh, that are consumed by humans. So they are extremely important economically and nutritionally to humanity, and we should pay attention. As you all know, there's an, an increasing drumbeat of bad news coming out about pollinators. Their numbers are dwindling uh, and dramatically so. So it appears that we have reached a tipping point ecologically for pollinators globally. And that tip, you know, it's, it's a confluence of, of development, right? We are converting habitat to built environment. We are using an increasing quantity of insecticides and herbicides that are negatively impacting these insects directly uh, and the and the animals that eat the insects and otherwise live in the habitat so birds also are declining and um, it's 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 very serious business we need to be very careful about completely disrupting our food chain so here are some direct benefits of pollinator friendly solar and you can see tons of these great photos. If you're looking for photos of pollinator-friendly solar, go to Fresh Energy's website, go to NG Solar's website. Uh, NG is a large French solar company that is uh, doing a lot in the United States. Lower maintenance cost is a win-win, right? You don't have to mow or treat the land as often as if you were growing turf grass, which is the alternative. And you see this diagram here, um, this line drawing in the bottom showing turf grass on the left, right? It has a depth of three to six inches and then native grasses and forbs, which reach down four to six feet. Sometimes I see 10 feet referenced as uh, for, for tall grass prairie plants. They have very deep roots and that provides uh, a variety of things, better drainage, of course, less runoff, uh, less erosion, and of course it is creating habitat, biodiversity for bees, uh, including native bees and honeybees and other wildlife. Can't emphasize enough the lower maintenance costs and um, and now what's emerging for our industry here in Illinois is that right out of the gate, we see lower overall uh, total cost of ownership and even lower cost of seeding a solar array with pollinator friendly seed because you have to use so much seed with turf grass. The pounds of seed per acre are much greater with turf than with pollinator friendly seed mixes. The pollinator plants, of course, are creating a microclimate. And so um, this is an ongoing area of research and they're creating evapotranspiration and 
cooling off the panels. Solar panels do not like heat. They uh, produce less voltage as they get hotter. And so a cooling effect from underneath would be a very good thing or from the sides. So these, these islands, the island effect of, of pollinator friendly solar farms is, is a win-win. And then of course, uh, there is a hypothesis that these rooted, deep rooted systems are going to reduce frost heave. So frost heave is a phenomenon here in the Midwest. And um, we've seen some very intense foundation systems being designed to avoid frost heave of the piles. So the piles are just I-beams or C-channel beams that are driven into the ground, typically if you have a deep topsoil. And they're driven sometimes 10 feet, 12 feet, 13 feet deep. Um, and then, of course, there are the aesthetics, and this is huge. A, a, a green turf solar farm is, of course, not a bad thing. Uh, I consider solar farms quite attractive. I consider them as attractive as farm fields, but farming communities feel differently, and it's, it's new to them. So that's the main thing, is that it, it is a change, and there is some nimbyism going on. So if you can leverage pollinator friendly as a PR tactic, you want to do that and you should do that. And it is going to be more aesthetically pleasing to the human eye when done well. Um, the alternative is that you will have uh, lots of weeds if you're not properly seeding or maintaining the array and that will not create good PR for you. So be careful. Um, this is a project I'm involved in right now. It's a 15-acre solar farm in the Joliet area in north central Illinois, uh, just uh, an hour outside of Chicago. And we are in the early planning stages of this project. But you see, uh, if we were going to do turf grass, we would be planting bluegrass or fescue or maybe a small number of fescue species. And then our pollinator seed mix is in this case, 17 species. The reference I see on, on other projects is, is up to 25 species. And uh, we've got some, these are all native plants that we're specifying. Uh, I'll just read a couple of them and I've got a couple photos here. So that this flower on the left is the nodding wild onion. Then we have some thimble weed here, the white flower in the middle, and then the butterfly weed, which is a milkweed. And while the, um, the butterflies use milkweed as a place to lay eggs, um, they and other, sorry, they will feed on many species of nectar. And so it's a, it's a both end. You need milkweed, but you also need other species and that diversity. A little more on the benefits, of course. It's good for bees, butterflies, insects, and birds that are all in decline. Um, and this is uh, just a disaster waiting to happen, not only for our food systems, which I've you know, noted 75% of our crops are pollinator uh, enhanced or dependent and this is due to the loss of habitat, the use of chemicals, um, pathogens have been a problem for honeybees. And again, that, that colony collapse that we've seen in honeybees is a confluence. That is the best science that has emerged. It's a confluence of events. It's no single factor. It's, it's that variety of factors. <clears throat> Soil erosion. Uh, needs to be taken very seriously. And here in Illinois, we have very flat ground and water runoff and stormwater runoff are, are, are real challenges and things that the state uh, and authorities having jurisdiction pay close attention to. So when you specify pollinator friendly, you're going to reduce uh, soil erosion and reduce stormwater runoff. The statistic I've seen on runoff is you will reduce runoff by a factor of two compared to turf or just uh, letting it go, so to speak. Letting it go is never a good idea here in the Midwest just because our, uh, our ground is so fertile 
and weeds are so pernicious. And then, you know, when done well, you are creating habitat for a variety of types of animals, uh, especially birds and butterflies and bees. The monarch has uh, been in the news a lot lately. It is uh, an indicator species and of course, very charismatic. So people love monarch butterflies because they're so pretty. Um, they are in steep, steep decline. And so the opportunity is that we're converting two to three million acres now of ground, much of it farm ground, to solar farms. And why not make those solar farms habitat for things like monarch butterflies? There's absolutely no reason. There's nothing stopping us except good planning and best practices and more sharing of knowledge. Those developers and installers that aren't doing pollinator friendly just don't know. They haven't kicked the tires enough and haven't done their homework. Because as I've now learned, it totally makes financial sense to go pollinator friendly. And it's so it's a, it's it's more cost effective for the owner, whoever that is, whether that's the host or a third party developer. And of course, it's going to be much better for the natural world. And and it's a cycle and it's a circle, right? We are connected to the natural world and we need to pay attention to what is going on uh, with all of the natural world. We are embedded in it. We forget that. <clears throat> so land use, this is a biggie. And this was hugely eye-opening for me. And I'm, uh, I'm grateful for uh, learning some of this stuff. But we, uh, this is a graphic from Bloomberg. And I, I include a link there so you can uh, download the PDF and get that link. Uh, they did a whole series of maps. I'm just going to show a couple of them. But this is how we use our land in the United States. And you'll see that big yellow square in the center, cow pasture, and then the slightly uh, different tan to the right of that livestock. That livestock is, uh, livestock feed is 40 million acres. Uh, those two squares combined are 40% of the land use in the United States. I've got one more slide about that coming up, but um, here is where our food comes from. Um, our total crop land is uh, 391 million acres. So keep in mind, we just want 10 to 15 million acres for solar and uh, to clean the grid. I haven't talked much about the health benefits of solar, but, but um, in the world, four and a half million people every year die from air pollution. And of course, coal and gas are contributing to that. <clears throat> so in the United States, 200,000 people annually die from air pollution. And that is a very serious uh, we're, we're basically looking at a greater than coronavirus impact every year from air pollution. And I don't want to minimize the epidemic that we're in right now, but air pollution is a, a bad that we externalize. We don't pay for it directly so much of the time, and we pay for it indirectly with our health. So converting our grid to wind and solar and batteries is going to be a win for human health on a grand scale. So 41% of the contiguous United States is used for feeding livestock. I had no idea. I knew it was a lot, but 40% is a lot. There's the 10 million acres called out in a black box. Uh, so we just <clears throat> we just need half a percent of the land area, eight percent of the area that's used for livestock feed. Um, if we can't afford that, we can't afford anything. Basically, <laughs> it's it's such a relatively trivial impact. You know, we've already 
built on and paved over about 6% of the landscape. So, and of course, solar is going to be integrated into the built environment as well. It's not an either or, it's a both and. And um, it's, it's such a win-win for humanity. It's, it's good for high wage jobs. And I, I would, I would highly recommend um, that you look into the book by Jeremy Rifkin uh, called The Green New Deal. It's a recent book that he wrote, and there are many books now on The Green New Deal with that title, but he's been running around the globe consulting with big governments like China and Germany, and um, they are 10 years ahead of us in seriously going after uh, the clean energy transition. And it's for every dollar that you invest in clean infrastructure, you get three dollars out in benefits and jobs. So it's just a complete no brainer. Some best practices, pollinator friendly solar. You see here a photo of a mower that has a swiveling arm. This, uh, this arm has a bumper. I don't have the video in, embedded, but uh, it, you can look it up on YouTube and the arm will run into this pile and then just scooch out of the way. So the tractor can just drive straight down the row and it's reaching underneath the backside of the array, getting at the, uh, the vegetation. Of course, one of the best practices with pollinator friendly solar is to mow less and to mow selectively and to mow uh, a taller mow. An eight inch mow is what I've seen recommended. And that's why the O&M costs are lower for pollinator friendly solar. You're not running a tractor through that field as often. That is expensive. It's also polluting. It's also hard on the ground. It's hard on everybody. And it creates the potential of, of accidents. Tractors can run into the solar array and break things, and that's expensive. So some things to look for and to pay attention to quality partners, right? You have to select a seed mix that is climate specific, geographic specific. There's a huge uh, variety of companies that specialize in native seed. You will not struggle to find native seed in any geography now in the United States. Of course, they need to up their game because this is a growth economy, but that is, that is happening. Um, planning early and engaging with all of the stakeholders early is very important. Pollinator friendly may seem like a no-brainer to those in the know, but farmers need to be uh, educated. They need dialogue. They need to digest and understand. Pollinator friendly landscapes are unfortunately not a common part of, you know, these ag landscapes where a majority of the land is in industrial cropping. And many farmers will look at a at, at this as uh, potentially hazardous because of weeds. Farmers are very nervous about weeds. So it, it takes a lot of dialogue and education. Site prep, you can reduce your site prep costs. Um, we, we certainly recommend as little moving of earth as possible. Uh, one of the reasons Earth gets moved on solar fields is to handle stormwater. And if you're planting with pollinators, you're like I previously said, you're going to reduce your stormwater runoff by a factor of two. And the AHJs are starting to recognize this. And then in the design, uh, you want to just make sure that the array is designed, of course, to allow enough sunlight under the array, putting the lower side of the panel at least. 30 to 36 inches off the ground is a, a good practice. There is some, uh, there are some experts who say 24 inches is enough. I would disagree. I think 36 is, is a better number. That allows you to have some taller forbs. Uh, of course, many prairie plants grow very tall. And so you can't just willy nilly put any tall grass prairie mix in your solar field. You have to select lower growth flowering plants. You don't want to have to mow them 
because you want them to flower so that the pollinators can leverage them and, and eat the nectar and uh, store the pollen and turn the pollen into food. There is now a growing phenomenon of pollinator scorecards. Uh, thanks to Fresh Energy and Rob Davis's work in the Twin Cities in Minnesota, uh, there are over 20 states now that have pollinator scorecards. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But um, finding the right partners, panels off the ground, selective mowing, you will need to do some chemical treatment in all likelihood. Uh, and this can be very selective, though, to keep down. The, uh, the weeds and the invasives. As far as construction practices, um, this is the what you're looking at, the solar farm in the background here is a project called Grand Ridge, uh, owned and operated by Invenergy, which is a developer out of Chicago. This is not a, a particularly pollinator friendly site. This is what I would call more of an industrial site, but um, you see a chain link fence. The recommendation for, for most uh, pollinator experts is use a farm fence, which has larger holes in the fence. It's, it's more of a rectangular hole. Uh, it's also cheaper, <clears throat> but um, keeping cables and conduits below ground as much as possible is a good. And that's a trade-off because it is a little more expensive than above ground systems. So there are always trade-offs. Here you can see in this upper right photo uh, what I mean by selective mowing. And so they mowed on the front edge of the array, which is low to the ground, where you are going to potentially get uh, shading from the vegetation on the array. Of course, shading is the enemy of solar arrays. You do not want shading. Uh, it is going to reduce your output. But behind the array, on the back side to the right here of this photo, right, you see some taller forbs and grasses. You don't have to mow that. So you have to educate your maintenance crews and make sure they know what they're doing and not just willy-nilly mowing the whole thing down, uh, especially when it's in bloom. So you have to be careful and you have to plan and educate. I've mentioned weeds a few times. Uh, this is not an uncommon site in central Illinois solar farms. Weeds grow very quickly and they can grow right up through the solar panels. And then you have a major shading problem. Of course, you have a major uh, PR problem. If anybody can see the array, this is just an eyesore and, and it causes farm communities high blood pressure. So <clears throat> get your weed whacker out there um, and, uh, or, your, or your sheep. And I will talk about grazing also. So these pollinator scorecards, and there's a spectrum. Um, some are voluntary, some are uh, now the law of the land. So I mentioned Minnesota. Minnesota got their pollinator scorecard in 2016. Um, this gentleman in the upper right is Adam Dolezal here at the University of Illinois. He was very involved in the development of the Illinois scorecard, which is one of the more rigorous ones. It's got um, pre and post aspects to the scorecard, pre and post construction. Uh, and then Rob Davis here in the lower right, who is uh, the director of the Center for Pollinators and Energy at Fresh Energy in Minnesota. They are the national clearinghouse on this topic. Uh, I highly recommend you check out their website, freshenergy.org. And um, Rob has some great TED Talks and, and YouTube Talks, so he's he's a real spokesperson. But you see here, there are over 20 states now that are developing scorecards. Um, I, and you'll find a, you'll find these scorecards on the Fresh Energy website. I, um, on the, and they have a generic one also. Um, and, and it addresses things like, well, what percent of the site is going to be vegetated with native grasses and forbs or wildflowers, right? Um, what percent of the site is dominated by native species? What is the cover diversity, you know, from low species count to high species count? And then you're accumulating points. It's very analogous to LEAD, uh, the USGBC's LEAD program. So this is the, the analog for pollinator-friendly 
using scorecards and it's appropriate that every region should have their own scorecard because we have different climate zones, different soil, different vegetation types, etc. So that's all well and good and whether or not you have a scorecard like Wisconsin doesn't quite have a scorecard yet. Well, doesn't mean don't use one. Go to Minnesota or go to Illinois uh, or go to Michigan, right? And you've got what you need. With, with trained ecologists, they can certainly help you with a seed mix that is going to be appropriate. Agrivoltaics. Agrivoltaics is just another word for pollinator friendly, frankly, but it, I like to say it includes crops and livestock. Uh, under solar, so dual purpose or multi-purpose solar. It, uh, you know, was formalized in the 80s. Japan and Germany were some of the earlier adopters, and that's true of solar in general. Um, we're, we're not quite as far along here in the U.S. with agrivoltaics. It is happening. Uh, I mentioned Adam Dolezal, and uh, he, is, he is doing research on bees and solar farms, and there's also a group that is looking at um, commercial ag and the application of these very tall arrays like you see here in the, in the uh, lower right corner. So this is a solar array that's just jacked up, uh, you know, say 12 to 15 feet off the ground. Of course, it does take more steel. And the steel you can estimate about $1,200 per acre per foot in height. So it's not prohibitively expensive. Uh, although it does add to the complexity of installing and maintaining these. So this is an area of, of, active, uh, of active research. And they have found though that you can get greater productivity. So shade, of course, is uh, good for some crops, strawberries, um, uh, certainly salad crops. And, and then there's those add-on effects of cooling of the panels lowering evapotranspiration, so you need to water the crops less. So there's there's some additive effects of combining solar and ag. Some more photos of, of these types of projects. And then, of course, here in the lower left, lower left, grazing of sheep. Sheep are the only livestock I'm aware of that have become an accepted practice combining with solar. Goats are too fond of jumping. They will jump up on the array and uh, damage the solar panels. Cows are too large. They want to scratch on things, and they will scratch on the posts and the modules and damage the array. So sheep uh, are, are great. They love the shade underneath the array. Of course, on a hot summer day, they will be lounging underneath the array. And, and of course, you have to design the array to be sheep friendly. You can't have cables dangling and things like that. But uh, all of these ranchers know how to corral their animals into narrow or broad spaces using small electric fences. So um, it's, it's really a good usage of uh, a good dual use for solar. And then, of course, honey is a big thing. Um, if you're near pollinator friendly landscaping, the honeybees will use that nectar and make honey out of it. And then they also use the pollen for food. Minnesota is, to my knowledge, the national leader in this topic. And, and you know, it's no accident that fresh energy is, is there in Minnesota. Um, and here you just see a list of, of some uh, utility scale projects. Their acreage on the right, 900,000, 370 and down. Um, so there's... There's a growing list of pollinator-friendly projects. Many of the community solar projects that are happening in Illinois are earmarked for pollinator-friendly. That large prairie solar here in Champaign County is also earmarked to be pollinator-friendly. So developers recognize that it is a win-win. Uh, a they may not know all the nuances of the win-win, and they may not have truly run the numbers yet, but it's a, it's a growing phenomenon. And um, so if you're involved or you know of a, uh, you know, a five plus acre solar farm, um, it's it's not hard to connect whoever that developer is to real experts, both on the developer side and then on the ecological 
and um, botanical side. There is now a dedicated American Solar Grazing Association in New York State, and they are actively doing research and demonstrating how livestock can coexist with solar. And um, so far, everything I've read about that is quite positive. Of course, the devil is in the details. And so you have to design the array to be animal friendly. And you've got to keep the animals away from uh, potentially damaging or, or being harmed by the electrical system. This is electrical infrastructure. We have to remember that. <clears throat> I think this is, uh, yeah, this is a slide of, of NREL's, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory, and they summed up so nicely um, the benefits of solar. So it's great for water quality protection, uh, reducing runoff, soil conservation, um, and creating waterway buffers. You know, industrial farming is very hard on water quality. We're leaching millions and millions of tons of nitrates, for example, into our waterways. And they just become, I mean, ultimately they become a dead zone in the Gulf of Mexico, right? I mean, that is an ecological disaster. So this is a way to counter that and convert a small percentage, but a, a, a a, a very significant amount of acreage, two to three million acres in the next decade, to valuable habitat for pollinators, small mammals, birds, reptiles. And then there's the agricultural opportunity with apiaries, grazing, handpicked crops, and pollinator benefits for other nearby crops, which uh, Argonne has documented so nicely. And then that, that the PV also benefits. So we have to remember that. It's not only good for the birds and the bees, it's good for the PV. Lower temperatures and lower O&M. This project is just a, a one I found on the, uh, the Grazing Association website showing uh, rotationally grazed. So, of course, you can't just leave the sheep on the same piece of ground because they will just bite it down to the nub and you won't have a pollinator anything. So you have to be careful about uh, that rotation. <clears throat> case studies, I'm going light on the case studies. I would like to get to some Q&A. So Brett, if you have any questions, uh, this is a good time to start that. Um, there is a utility in the upper Midwest called Dairyland. And uh, they're mainly in Wisconsin, but also in Illinois and I think parts of Minnesota. They've done to date, at least 18 megawatts of, um, of pollinator-friendly solar farms. This is one called Whistling Wings. I found this on the NG website. NG is the developer. Uh, I think Dairyland and NG have done quite a few projects together, but there's other developers that have done projects with them as well. You see another here example of a single axis tracker. The rows are actually going north-south, and then the uh, solar panel is rotating east-west and so it rotates to the east in the morning catch and then tracks the sun across the sky and you get about a 10 to 15 percent bump in the output by using a tracker so we see trackers now coming in on about 80 percent at least of the projects if, if there's too much terrain then they would go with a, a fixed ground mount or a ballasted ground mount but a lot of trackers are coming and that you know it's uh, you can see this is either early in the morning or late in the afternoon, and, and the tracker is allowing a lot of uh, light behind the solar array, more so than with a fixed ground mount. So in my opinion, we're going to get more traction with trackers and pollinator friendly. That's just my personal opinion. So in the uh, upper right, and then lower right, you see two, what establishing pollinator friendly two years later, right? So first, uh, a construction site gets beat up pretty good. Some people have the misperception that you can plant prior to construction. That, that's a no-no. You want to wait until post-construction. There's a lot of heavy equipment running around, <clears throat> and you're just going to have to reseed. So it's it's not a good use of resources 
wait until the array is fully functional and then do the seeding or near fully functional. And you have to do three to four years of active heavy maintenance and then you can slow that down and then just come on once or twice a season. But in the early stages, you're going to have to do more mowing and more chemical treating to keep out the weeds, keep out the invasives, keep down the woody plants and give those native pollinators a chance. The weeds will outcompete the natives if you just set it and forget it. So that's, that's critical. Be patient, be smart. Um, and then there's the perimeter you see, you know, we leave 20 feet is a standard between the array and the fence. And that's a nice buffer that you can use. You're only going in there once or twice a season with a tractor. And so it really does have a chance to grow up and become dense vegetation. By all means, don't gravel it. And, and that is, uh, you know, uh, just some civil engineering firms will recommend that out of the gate. And, and that's just a, a tragedy. It's going to cause much more runoff and a lost opportunity for, uh, for the community of people and living things. Of course, there are some real uh, retail economics going on here now. People are making beer with solar honey. Uh, started in Minnesota, but is now spread nationally. If you Google beer and solar honey or uh, cosmetics and solar honey, you will find tons and tons of private companies that are getting into the game and promoting this to consumers. People want to buy uh, solar honey and products made from solar honey. And they peep and, and consumers realize that honeybees are in trouble. And so we need to do more. We need to create more habitat that is honeybee friendly. I mentioned that I stand on many shoulders and here are some of those faces. You've already seen Adam there in the upper right and Rob in the lower right of Fresh Energy. Adam is with the University of Illinois. He's an entomologist that specializes in honeybees. Um, Gavin Meinshine here in the middle on the lower is a civil engineer with NG. I'm grateful to Gavin and Rob especially for turning me on to uh, this ecosystem of uh, pollinator friendly solar. So thank you guys. And then um, this is uh, Dr. Oberhauser in the lower left with a butterfly on her head. She is a monarch specialist and uh, she has created something called the um, Monarch Joint Venture. So um, she's a thought leader on how to protect monarch butterflies. With that, I will turn it over to our audience for some Q&A. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks, Tim. Yeah, we've got some questions coming in. And uh, before we get to those questions, real quick, um, for those of you wanting to get your Con Ed, make sure to take that survey that pops up or take it um, in your email. It'll be sent to you later. For those of you watching this in the future, not right now, please make sure to take your uh, 10 question quiz. You can find that quiz uh, from our YouTube channel by clicking the YouTube link. On the left there, click the show more button. And on the right there, follow it down until you see the quiz link. And before we get to those questions um, and keep putting them in there, a huge thanks to all of our sponsors, our board of directors, our members, our volunteers, everyone who helps us uh, do what we do here. A big uh, thanks to them. We really appreciate that. So, Tim, let's talk a little bit about water here. I've got a question and then another question came in, so I'm going to kind of merge them together. Uh, you had briefly mentioned, from what I could tell, water when you were talking about grazing. Um, but uh, what about just, you know, you know, pollinator friendly? Does that end up being more drought tolerant versus conventional? And then how does that play out with these types of systems if people are doing them in uh, the arid Midwest? You know, would they need more irrigation? Yeah, for sure, drought tolerance will be greater in a pollinator situation. The native plants are adapted to the environment. And while the climate is changing, so we're having 
more intense uh, flooding and hot spells in the upper Midwest. Um, generally speaking, the alternative being turf grass, right? If there's a drought, uh, the turf grass is not going to fare well, whereas the prairie plants have those really deep root systems and are more resilient and are going to survive. Not all of them. Uh, drought will be hard on and, and will kill some vegetation, but in general, you're going to get much more resilience uh, from from native plants than you will from uh, turf grass. <clears throat> Does that answer your question? Uh, I, I I do believe so. If they wanted to follow up, then you know they can they can go ahead and do that. So, um, so uh, oh, okay, uh, that was a comment. Um, how burn management or simulations? handled for the control of woody basic, uh, woody invasive species in these situations? Good point. And uh, of course, if you know anything about vegetation ecology, you know that grasslands are fire dependent landscapes. Uh, historically, that was what prevented them from getting super woody. So you had regular fires, uh, perhaps as frequent as every three to five years. Uh, sweeping across the landscape and and killing much of the woody plants, not all of it. Some some trees like the bur oak are very fire tolerant, and you get this savanna landscape. But um, in a solar array, you cannot have fire. It's it's just uh, not compatible with the, that infrastructure, and so you have to mimic the fire regime with mowing primarily. That is the tactic, mechanical maintenance. Mm -hmm. And um, the challenge is doing it in a way that is also friendly to the to the forbs and grasses um, that are going to be used for habitat. Uh, great, thanks. Um, tell me a little bit more about um, obviously solar generates renewable energy credits so you can get RECs that way. Are there any potential uh, carbon offset value to be added to a pollinator friendly farm where these types of plants maybe are, are, are generating or, or sequestering more carbon than a conventional um, uh, grass would do. Yeah, so one of, the, one of the things that people are so excited about renewable energy for is that it is reducing the carbon footprint of our built environment. We recognize that we need to decarbonize our economy and our grid infrastructure because that's causing runaway global warming, but there's additional carbon sinks in native landscapes, right? Those root systems are uh, massive amounts of carbon that are basically being pumped from the atmosphere into the earth and sequestering carbon. I'm not an expert on soil science and carbon sequestration by native plants, but the long and short of it is you compare that turf grass root system to the 10 feet of prairie plants and you recognize immediately that there is intrinsic value and it's just a matter of time before we start to quantify that and uh, value that. I'm not aware of any organizations that are really uh, touting the carbon sequestration of their pollinator friendly solar arrays yet, but for sure that is a benefit. Um, let's talk about these checklists. Um, I uh, It sounds like these checklists to help guide this is really on a state by state or regional level. It's not like there's some sort of like US or national pollinator friendly standard that maybe stands outside of the state or, or is there kind of a hybrid of the two or, or can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yeah, my uh, my recommendation and, and this is the phenomenon that has emerged is it is a regional thing. It's a st mostly on a state by state basis. Um, there's a lot of overlap, of course, right? If you looked at the Minnesota checklist and you looked at the Illinois checklist, there's a lot of similarities. And what it boils down to, though, is, you know, percentage of ground cover in native plants and pollinator friendly uh, species. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, we do need a national organization, and that appears to be fresh energy right now. We'll see. Uh, they're focused on the Midwest, I think, and the and the Northeast, where there this phenomenon has definitely gotten traction. California, I don't see why it's it's not more active, and I'm curious what's going on there. I'm sure there is work going on. California tends to be its own universe. It's such a large state, 
it is also a very mature solar industry or solar market um, and very diverse ecologically. There's, you know, mountains, desert, uh, coastal regions, grasslands, et cetera. And uh, so there's there's definitely room for a lot of growth and improvement in these in the checklists on a regional basis, but it's got to start locally and then hmm. um, and then grow together, so to speak, I guess, into a national uh, phenomenon. Thank you. Um, and what about um, you know you I, I've seen more obviously than just food getting organic certified. You know uh, uh, you see T-shirts, socks, um, you know all sorts of types of clothing and apparel. So, I mean, do you see maybe, you had mentioned several times the chemical treatment, uh, which I can understand being necessary, but do you see a, a, a connection between the two of, um, uh, you know, non or safer chemical through like an organic certification and this um, pollinator friendly solar? Certainly, you know, if you're growing bees uh, and you want to make certified organic honey, you have to be careful about wh what those bees are eating. And I, I'm not a, a bee specialist mm. and I'm, I'm curious, right? because bees fly and they and and they're foraging over a pretty big area i don't know the the full the, the full details there but it's over a kilometer that a bee will fly uh, on its on its daily foraging route um from the from the hive and so um yes organic solar farms will be a thing I did not run into any organic solar farms in my research for this presentation. I'm sure Rob at Fresh Energy has run into that. So mm -hmm. reach out to Rob and uh, he's not hard to find uh, and, and he would gladly talk to you about that topic. But of course, it will be a thing. Uh, mm -hmm. if, you're, if you're growing something edible and that something needs or that product needs to be organic, then, and that is one of the beauties. I love this about solar farms in general that if you do it right you are converting just in in illinois for example we're converting industrial farm ground corn and beans which is heavily fertilized and pesticided uh to potentially organic ground the the solar ray is going to be there for 25 years and and then of course it could be repowered you could leave the infrastructure and just put new panels on but even if you wanted to recapture that ground and convert it to farm ground, you then potentially have true organic ground if you've treated it properly. It's only in the first couple of years that you're going to need pesticide treatments to keep out the invasives. Once you've got a routine going and a good seed mix going, you're off to the races and you've got an organic farm on your hands. Yeah, great. Um, and... Uh, um, one other question, uh, do you see an opportunity or see this happening where potentially um, solar installers are partnering with landscape architects on even small projects where people are putting um, ground mount arrays on their house or near their house or adjacent land um, to sort of offer a package of, you know, solar plus pollinator? Good question. And and here in Urbana, you know, I'm proud to live in, in Urbana, which is an eco-friendly community. We have uh, we have the opportunity to turn your turf grass lawn into a pollinator-friendly uh, herb and forb garden and, and designate it as such and not get uh, in any way dinged by the authorities, right? If you just let your lawn grow and get super weedy, the authorities will come knocking and say, hey, mow your lawn right. uh, because your neighbors are complaining and there are ordinances on these things. But sure. the, uh, the flip side of that is there are also ordinances on if you grow a pollinator friendly garden, that is an acceptable use. And so small, medium, large, this applies. You can, uh, you can take your uh, one eighth acre lot for your house and turn that into a pollinator garden if you really want to. Yeah, great, Tim. Well, um, we are at our time. I do not see any more questions. So um, I really wanna thank you um, and your company, uh, Continental Energy Solutions for your time here. Where can people go to find out more information or contact you if they wanna learn more? I am uh, very easy to find on LinkedIn. I like LinkedIn a lot. So just look me up on LinkedIn or on Twitter at 
TG Montague. TG as in gun Montague. I do want a second, Tim, there. I follow him on Twitter and learned a lot. Uh, just a very inspirational and you know, just useful post to, to learn what's going on in the solar field. So I encourage you all to follow him there and, and learn more and connect. And thank you again for your time. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Be sure to check out all of our courses available online that you can watch anytime and anywhere to pick up your CEUs. Before you go, make sure to subscribe to us on YouTube to get weekly updates and stay up to date on green building science courses, webinars, and home tours. Thanks again.